Hi, I'm Thomas Allen Harris, host of Family Pictures USA. And we're here today to commemorate Labor Day. Um, it's a pre-Labor Day event uh, with some wonderful and very special guests, uh, including, uh, and first off, Marcy Brennan, who is a TCP, oh, I'm sorry, TPM <laughs> certified um, a photo organizer uh, who helps people manage, organize, curate, uh, their photo uh, graphic archives and, and also other archives. Welcome, Marcy. Thank you, it's great to be here. So Marcy, um, uh, tell me how you got started uh, with this and also what is a TPM certified photo organizer? Okay, I'll work backwards. Um, TPM stands for the photo managers. We um, are an organization founded by Kathy Nelson um, and we changed, she changed the name recently. Um, we were formerly known as the Association of Professional or Personal Photo Organizers. So, um, and Kathy Nelson is actually a supporter of the project and she's uh, worked with us under the previous name of the company. <laughs> so instead of APA, we're now TPM. Okay, good. I'm glad to be updated. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, uh, I, I stumbled onto photo organizing through a friend of mine, um, I had finished my time at the Batman Archive, which we did discuss, and um, I was looking for something to do, and I had a couple of interim jobs, and I didn't really, I really, really miss working with photos. And um, so my friend sent me an email saying, hey, you should check out the Association of Personal Photo Organizers, and I looked at their website, and I was like, oh my god, this is me. I went all in, and a month later, I had my very first client, who's still a client. So. It's been really great. And so tell me, what do you do with clients? If you know, I mean, I'm actually a filmmaker and I've been using my own family photographs and um, Super 8 VHS tapes, audio tapes to make films. And I organize them per project, you know? So if I'm making a film about one thing, then I'll organize the images I use, I import them into uh, Premiere or uh, another editing uh, system. Um, and then they go get dumped back into this big box. And so what like, what do you do as a photo organizer? Well, it really depends on the client's end goals and um, what they have to start out with. So um, I typically work with clients who have huge analog collections, uh, basically their own mini Batman archive. Uh, they may have tens of thousands of print photos, slides, negatives, videos, old media that they want, organized and usually the first thing we do is we, we physically organize them we get them out of their um <clears throat> sticky albums that they happen to be in those magnetic sticky albums which i do not like because they are chemical sandwiches so we'll get them out of there we'll get them into archival photo safe acid-free boxes or some other type of container and then we'll start scanning them if they want most clients do want digital copies so we'll scan them um depending on, on what the medium is, we'll use a variety of different scanning options, such as camera scanning or a flatbed scanner or a high-speed scanner. All those are fun. Um, and then we'll take half of their digital images because the digital images tend to be the real bug of um, Since people have these things now, um, while it's- Tens of thousands of images. Tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of digital images. And they're not worth saving. So one of the most important things we have to do is teach our clients to edit, and I help them with that. Curate their photos, mm -hmm. nice and lean library. Mm -hmm. so overwhelmed with tens of thousands of images. Well, that was actually a theme in a recent New York Times um, uh, article that quoted Kathy Nelson, mm -hmm. uh, how to you know sort through and throw out images that like you know you don't necessarily need or you know that you, you know we go we you know in the analog space and that's the space where you would take a 35 millimeter um reel of film and you'd get 36 exposures you'd have these four by sixes 36 of them and out of those there might be like what two three four five if you're lucky you know images that really tell a story or that hold something important in your heart or that document at, at you know an important moment from a you know a particular perspective but then the rest might be kind of like whatever 
And so you're saying that we can throw out about 30 of those images. Yeah. I think that's actually good. Kathy said as well in the article. Yeah, yeah. That's emotionally really not only challenging, but potentially draining to do something like that. It is, it is. Uh, Kathy coined the term ABCs. So mm -hmm. A is for album, B is sort of your B-roll, C is for can, like you can throw them away. And the mm -hmm. S is for the story. So you have to make mm -hmm. sure that the photo has a story. And she also has a two second rule, which I think is so brilliant. When you're going through photos, you don't want to sit there and linger over the photo because you go down that rabbit hole memory lane. Just you got to move quickly. You got to edit ruthlessly. Um, and you got to stay on target. And it's really hard for people to do that, which is why they often hire photo organizers to do it for them. So that you come in. So if you, why don't you run it down for me? So you, let's say, yeah, I know in, with different clients, it works in different ways, but give me one scenario. Well, we uh, were contacted by a client who lives in Florida and she was perfectly comfortable sending her massive collection to me. And so she has tons of analog prints and we are scanning them, um, we're organizing them. We're putting them in archival boxes. Um, here's an example. This is a slide box from a company called Archival Methods, and all of the slides are in here. They will be labeled and organized. Um, they're scanned. They're going to be sent back to her. She's going to have a beautiful, cohesive library, um, mm -hmm. and it's going to merge with her digital photos. And so once we get we're, – we're doing the analog first, and then once we get to her digital photos, everything will be merged, and she'll have a beautiful library. Um, she will have to send me her access to her digital photo stream probably – via app, and she's probably on an iCloud, um, and I'll be able to edit from there and help her. It's going to be awesome when it's done. She's going to be so psyched. Then she's going to have a legacy to give her daughter, and she's not going to be overwhelmed with hundreds of thousands of photos, and she's also going to be able to make books, photo mm -hmm. books. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful book to share. Mm -hmm. So uh, some, some of the products are, and I think you just described you know, a couple, is one passing it down, something that's organized, you know, in some ways, like it's like kind of making a, it's not like making a will, but it's making a kind of a, maybe oh. a, a kind okay. of living will perhaps, you know, or a narrative, passing down the family story. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that before the ubiquity of people taking photographs and documenting everything, you know, when, when photographs were a little bit more rare and people printed them out, selected an image and put them in the album, you know, since then we've actually, um, we've actually um, stopped doing that and it just gets dumped somewhere. And so, you know, that sense of curation is I think what we lost and in some ways, you know, different people trying to figure out how to bring those back. Absolutely. It's, it's just too easy to take too many photos. And as, as a matter of fact, my photos, my personal photo collection is about 5,000 photos. That's mm -hmm. it. I'm really, mm -hmm. really strict. <laughs> okay, okay. To a fault, but <laughs> I just feel it's less is more. I think it tells a better story. Mm -hmm. 20,000 mm -hmm. pictures of me as a, you know, three-year-old at my your old birthday like two or three photos suffice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well great well i you know i am actually working on a new film about my mom and um so i'm collecting a lot of photographs you know either that feature her or feature organizations that she's been involved in and it's just been amazing to find so many images but also to think about well how do i begin organizing these images and it makes me really happy and excited that you know we've collected these things and we've kept them you know safe mm -hmm. and relatively organized and um but i know that i do have a much larger collection <laughs> that has to be <laughs> tackled you know uh and uh you know that and so i'm slowly picking up tips from you guys you know about how to how to do this so it's exciting to have you you know, here sharing some of it with us. And I'm sure you'll share more as we go forward. Um, I did want to go now to some of your photographs. Okay. Um, you brought some images here which tell a story. And so this is an example of like what images are important that, that are part of um, Marcy's 5,000 images <laughs> collection. Okay, so this first image um, obviously is two men with a baby. So who's in this image and, and why did you keep this particular image and select it to share, share today? Well, this image was given to me by my Aunt Cheryl. Um, I didn't know my father. I've met him twice in my life. Um, and this is the only photo I have of myself 
and my grandfather, his father, um, together. So I was really like shocked, and I realized that 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 photo was taken inside a very large house that my grandfather owned. Um, and where where was it? It's in Mendham, New Jersey. Um, mm. Southern. And, Southern New Jersey? Yeah, yeah. And it's just, um, I still look at it and think like, who, what was going on? Who took the photo? I'm assuming my mother took the photo. Um, they were divorced shortly after that was taken. Um, mm -hmm. I just have so many questions and I can't get the answer to them because my father passed away about 15 years ago. And so I was unable to connect with him one last time. And I was really ready at that point. So it's unfortunate. Um, but that story is, um, is documented in this book that Kathy wrote um, called Photo Organizing Made Easy. And we can come back to this because it's got a ton of excellent tips to it. But I just wanted to mention it because my story's in there along with the story of 10 other photo organizers who talk about their their perspective and how the photographs have changed their lives. Mm. Wow, great, great. Thank you. I love that book. Um, so we're going to go to the next uh, photograph, and that is... That's me. That's the only picture I have of myself as a baby. Um, and what is that that you're holding, or what's that, that you're, you have your hand on? Looks like a little, like uh, some sort of a little toy, some shoe. I, I don't even know. But I, I do have to mention that um, I don't have a lot of photos also because of two house fires that I survived. Um, uh -huh. I survived, the photos didn't. So that's another reason why I became a photo organizer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad that you survived. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things, I mean, every, I think that's everyone's fear is like, you know, with fire or flood, right? And um, mm -hmm. and people grab their images, you know, particularly with floods, which might give you a little bit more time. Yep. Um, but um, what do you suggest to people who have analog images you know, uh, in terms of making sure they survive, you know, these types of uh, catastrophes? You know, it depends on how many you have, but at the very least, you know, you, you want to store them in boxes that are archival. Mm -hmm. But that won't prevent anything from, that won't prevent things from burning up or being no, no, in, in it the water. Won't, it won't, I mean, you can put them in plastic bins that are, that are watertight, but really the best thing you can do is scan everything have them mm -hmm. on external hard drives, have the external hard drives stored at different places, maybe one at a friend's house or relatives, mm -hmm. as well as your home, um, and also in the cloud. So mm -hmm. you have that sort of backup. Um, I was talking to my husband's cousin who said she has her, you know, she lives in Southern California and she has her go box and it contains an external hard drive with all of her photos that she religiously updates. Mm -hmm. so, oh, after my own heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next photo. That's um, one of the few photos I have of myself at that age. Myself, my great grandmother who barely spoke English, and my sister Lisa and my sister Jennifer in the corner looking up at me with a bunny. I just love that wow. photo. It's taken on Mother's Day. It just makes me so, so happy. Wow. It's, it's, is that a cake in the background too, or no? Is that those are just a cake? It is a cake. Oh. And so, so is you now your grandmother was an immigrant then? Yes, yes, my, that's my great grandmother. Your great, great grandmother. Where was she from? Italy, obviously, right? She's from she's oh. born in New Jersey. She's Italian, and you got to have the big cake. What kind of a party is it without a big cake? There's Who's probably birthday? only two. <laughs> and but whose birthday was it? Did I miss that? It was her. It was Mother's Day. Oh. So and so, is your mom behind the camera? Probably. Mm -hmm. Probably. She was a she was a, the family photographer. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Beautiful image and the colors held up. They did. they did. Looks like you have a bunch of people. You're, you're waiting for a bunch of people to come by. Uh-huh. So let's go to the next image. Right. So this is one of the only photos I have of my father. Um, he's the guy in the light colored sweater. Um, mm -hmm. His arm is around his sister in the mm -hmm. Argyle sweater. Um, the young man below is my um, uncle. And the other woman in the photo is my step grandmother, and then my grandfather, and a dog. I don't know anything about the dog. It looks like a hound, actually. The yeah, dog. Big, big, I don't know Irish Setter or something. Uh huh. But this is another photo that my aunt gave me. I didn't. I this house that they lived in had like eleven bedrooms, and it's just huge, huge house. And I visited it, and I thought, mm -hmm. oh, 
<laughs> who needs a house that big? Apparently my grandfather did. And um, yeah, it's ironic that the home that my husband and I live in now looks exactly like that one, except it's like a sliver of the size. Uh -huh. But not in New Jersey, it's in Queens, isn't it? Yes, yes. but mm -hmm. built at the same time, it's a brick house, the same style, everything. Mm -hmm. it, I, it was really weird seeing that photo because I felt like there was this weird connection arch architecturally and, and mm. on other levels, which none of us would have had any idea was going to transpire. So. so tell me, I mean, when you look at this image, you know, we have that, that kind of dimensional kind of, um, connection, you know, between your present house and this house that, you know, that you hadn't necessarily seen before, remembered. Uh, what do you I mean? When, what do you feel when you look at this image? Um, longing. I, I wish that I had known that. I mean, my father gave birth, well, my father met my mother and gave birth to me shortly after this photo was taken. So mm -hmm. it would have been nice to spend some time there with those people. But mm -hmm. it happened. Mm -hmm. And where do you keep this image and, and some of the images that you've shown us today? Where, um, where, do they, where, where are they in your, your home? They are on <laughs> all my devices, safely <laughs> backed up. The prints are stored in, in archival boxes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so everything is, everything is digital. I don't, I don't often pull out the physical photographs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem like you have a, a really solid digital setup behind you. Yes. So, so we're going to go to another, um, another a document this time. So, tell us what exactly is this document? This is really cool. Um, my grandmother was a telephone operator, switchboard operator in the early 1920s, uh, and this is an award for. Um, I'm going to look at my copy here. Mm -hmm. uh, the the traffic department employees and the Rockaway Central offices and volunteers from other offices. Uh, they were. She was honored this um, Theodore N. Vail Medal for heroic action and out, outstanding devotion to duty at a time of great disaster. So she was handling the switch the switchboard operator when the Picatinny Arsenal blew up. Um, and the Picatinny Arsenal blew up due to a thunderstorm that happened. Um, it's not unlike what happened in Beirut recently. Mm -hmm. um, there was this the arsenal with 600,000 tons of munitions and it Blew up, mm -hmm. flattened the you know area for miles around, and of course people were completely freaked out. And my grandmother worked the switchboard for something like seventy-two hours straight. She told me that her father came and just helped prop her up, keep her sitting up in her chair as she's doing all of this and giving her water. She would take an hour nap and then get back to work. And so she and her colleagues worked tirelessly to make sure that people were connected. I mean, we didn't have these cell phones, you know, and and, and at that time. I don't even think there were dial phones. I think you just picked up your phone and the operator would answer and you say, I want to talk to so-and-so at this number and they would connect you. So she really helped um, the town recover and, and make sure the first responders got to the scene of the fire. I, I can't I, I can't imagine what it took to do that. 72 hours straight. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So she was basically, I mean, there's, uh, you know, obviously a lot of discussion right now during the pandemic around essential workers who are keeping, you know, the systems we're used to, you know, functional as we go through these, you know, these, these waves of uh, the, you know, crisis, crises. Um, uh, and we're also, you know, at this point, you know, celebrating Labor Day, you know, these people who, um, you know, whose labor in many ways is, is invisible you know, is not necessarily kind of um, uh, foregrounded in terms of uh, social media or you know, traditionally or in, in the newspaper, you know, and your grandmother, you know, made this huge contribution, you know, at, during this, this moment and, uh, and was awarded. Is this a story that was passed down and, 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 and in what ways was it passed down and how did it inform who you became or your mom became? My grandmother was a very humble person. So she just sort of, you know, it's just sort of an off the cuff story that she would tell us once in a while. And I was like, what? Are you kidding? She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was a different, you know, she's very, very modest about it. You know, it was sort of, I think that generation, it was expected of you to do that sort of thing. Like you wouldn't think twice about it. Um, Let's actually go, is there a photograph of her? 
next, let's go to the next photograph as we're talking about her. And if you just tell her, tell us your her name. Next one, next one. Next that's one, right after this. Yeah, that's her. So this was about 12 years after the event. Um, mm -hmm. She's very honest about it, you know. Um, I, I think, you know, the greatest generation is the greatest generation for a reason. You know, they really mm -hmm. stepped mm -hmm. up and they didn't ask questions. It just, it was dutiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was really great. And her name? Adeline. 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 Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's named Adeline, Sarah, Adeline Leonard in that in the document. Mm -hmm. But uh, she married my grandfather and took his name. So Adeline Serafino was her name before she died. Mm -hmm. She's a great, great woman. I miss her. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure, thank you. And there is that one other photograph that came right before that. This um, is this a stereo view? What did, what no, did no. This is a. This is um. While we were talking about preservation, this is a photo from um, a client's collection, and she's given me permission to share. Um, you can see that one of those photos is heavily silvered, and it's one that's not clear. Um, and this is just an example of a process we do with camera scanning where we're, we are able to get the silver out of old photographs so you can really enjoy them. Um, this photo also had silvering, but it's not as important because it's not of somebody's face. But we just wanted to show that, to show the audience what's possible with old photographs because oftentimes people think, oh, you know, there's nothing I could do, or they just scan it straight away and think, oh, that's the way it looks. But you know, it's part of the decay. It's it's it's, it's a chemical process with them. So, so the silver oxidize? Is yeah. that? Yeah, it happens to old photos and even photos up until the 1960s. Hmm. And so you work with your your husband as well, Chris. Does he? Yeah. Uh, does you want to? Does he want to join in and tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about uh, about this? So so how did you? Uh, well, welcome, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. So uh, how did you um, realize that you could actually bring out so much more detail by um, uh, working uh, with the silver content in the photograph? And, and, and I'm assuming this is also part of the um, uh, digitization process or it happens after it's been digitized. And so you're, you're well, how, I don't actually, I'm assuming. So why don't you tell us? Right, right. Well, it's trial and error, like everything. You know, you make some mistakes until you realize that that's an avoidable mistake and there are, there is technology to fix something. So the first time we got um, silvered prints from a client, uh, we have three different methods of scanning. And all three methods, um, you know, some are better for some things and some are better for other, other uh, formats and mediums. Uh, the silvering was kind of a problem with all of them. And we just thought like, okay, the, the print has sort of silvered over time mm -hmm. and that's just the way it is. So when we scan it, you know, it'll, it'll show up in the scan, maybe in Photoshop as a post-production thing, we can kind of, you know, uh, restore it and mask it out. Mm -hmm. But then you realize when you're dealing with so many photos and you're trying to custom fix them one at a time, it, it's, a, it's a significant amount of labor involved. Uh, mm -hmm. Some things aren't so easy either. Like if it's just background, it's one thing, but if it's over somebody's face or a large area of detail, it's very hard to custom retouch that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a little bit of research, um, you know, both just through online and through the APO community of other professional photo organizers. And we uh, learned that just through some polarizing filters on a camera. So one of our methods of scanning is actual camera scanning. Uh, so you're literally taking a photograph of the photograph, mm -hmm. um, but it's done with a copy stand and, and non-reflective glass to keep the photo flat and then two side lights. And over those lights are uh, neutral, uh, like neutral density filters. Mm -hmm. And then there's a polarizing filter that screws right onto the lens of your camera. And between those filters, and you can look through your camera's viewfinder and you can see all the silvering that is reflecting in the print. And just by turning the polarizing filter, uh, you know, one, in one direction, you'll start to see that it, it just darkens all of the silvering. The silvering like just kind of almost miraculously disappears. And not only does it get rid of the silvering, but it brings back the detail that's in the actual photograph. Mm -hmm. So you can 
see, like, look at her hair in that photo. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hair on the before shot on the left is kind of a disaster. Mm -hmm. And on the right, you can see like actual hair strands in the, in the, you know, throughout her entire mm -hmm. head, but also in the dark areas, you're really getting the detail. And these are low res. This is a low res example that we sent for you to just uh, show. So the high res is even, you know, much more detailed. More luminous. It's, just, um, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to restore these photos back to what they were supposed to look like. And our client was like, oh my God. I had no idea. Yeah, and I also just love that kind of rich black. Mm -hmm. Like, it, there's just something so dramatic and beautiful about it. And that's what know? the photographer's original intent was. Right, so. and yeah, and I, you can imagine that's what it looked like, you know, when it was developed. 1925. You know, and, and nobody has seen that photo look like that, you know, in decades, yeah. you know, because they, they got used to the silvered print, and that's just what it looks like now. It's really starting to fade out. Eventually, it'll it'll just be completely faded. Wow. So, um, well, good to know. And and so, um, this image originally was what in 1940s or 30s? Earlier, it's probably the late 20s. Early late 20s. 20s. Mm -hmm. I thought so, but I wasn't. I wasn't, especially with the style. But I wasn't completely sure. Wow, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous image. Beautiful. Okay, so I want to thank you so much for for um, for joining us and sharing some of your tips and tools and strategies. Um, we're going to uh, go to the next part of the program, but we're going to bring you back uh, as we're going to also talk a little bit about archives. And I know you have a little bit of experience with the uh, Bettman archive as well. So, so, um, so hold on and we're going to, uh, we're going to go to now to Andre Vaughn. Uh, Andre Vaughn is an archivist, a curator, um, he is on faculty at the um, at Central um, Central uh, Central, Central, Central University. Central University, and he was also featured. You were featured in our Family Pictures USA North Carolina episode with wonderful images. And uh, in fact, we want to go to that first image. And uh, so, um, Andre Vaughn, tell us why you decided to participate in the uh, pilot season of Family Pictures USA when you were shooting in North Carolina. Well, well, well first of all, um, Thomas, I want to thank you all. Um, well, it, it allows you to sort of um, have a chance to sort of bring out of the archives, my own personal archives, family archives, an uh, uh, image of, of one who really has not had much attention but one who really, whose life story, I think really is worth telling. Uh, and so this is a photograph, of course, me uh, here with my great, great uncle, Benjamin Franklin Hawkins, um, born in 1850, um, died in 1930 in wow. our little hometown of Henderson. And wow. so, so anyway, so this, this story again um, of his life, you know, as a, a person, we talk about Labor Day. Well, well, he was a brick mason by trade. Uh, and so um, that and that was a question of independence, you know, um, in the South. And mm -hmm. and so he was his own boss. And I think that to me is what very much represents, you know, who my family has been all over the years, uh, a family, very independent, um, self-sufficient uh, and and none other than great, great Uncle Benjamin there and his all all full there in his um, portrait there. And this portrait was um, what it was. Yeah, I, I would say two and a half, maybe feet by three feet, or it's thereabouts. And huge cardboard uh, print, uh, pr or printed on cardboard. It had suffered some damage. Right. And uh, if we can go to the next image, and I think, it, or the image after this, um, uh, th this this is what it looks like after you had it restored. Yes. So uh, now you now what happened is that when you had it restored, he also lost a little bit of his uh his his uh kind of beard chops uh, the the mustache. If we can go back to the the the, the original, so how did you but feel? Contrast. <laughs> yeah, the big contrast. So um so so how did you feel about, about you know the this issue of restoring you know images you know and um you know, I mean obviously some details lost. Something is gained. We saw an image that that we um, uh, from uh, that that Marcy shared with us that you know that that took out the silver and made it a little bit clearer. So there is obviously something that's a little clearer with the new image, but we also lost some things. 
Yeah, well, uh, again, I, I remember I was maybe 10 or 12 years old when I first had a chance to see that, uh, see that portrait once hanging uh, in my cousin, uh, as we call our aunt, up the street for me. And so it was not until, like I said, you know, uh, maybe um, up to about two years ago that I was reunited with that photograph after all these years, this portrait. And, uh, and, and again, it, it hung, uh, you know, proudly in the entryway uh, of, uh, of our relative's home. And, and so, too, I knew it was important that this image should be shared because, again, uh, Uncle Benjamin, like uh, many of his brothers and my great grandfathers and others, I mean, they really live beyond expectation uh, mm -hmm. of a race wise that was placed upon them. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, there's nothing more uh, revolutionary, almost in a sense, than this image here because it's powerful and it speaks against the day in which he lived. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, I, I'm just glad to be able to sort of help to tell his story just a little bit more, you know, as a, a man who was a, a born enslaved. But mm -hmm. went on to become his own boss uh, and was a brick mason mm -hmm. by trade, by the way, mm -hmm. in Halifax County, North Carolina, a large landowner. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's one that, uh, as I told folks, he died in Henderson, 1930. And they mm -hmm. were still calling his name in the 1980s and 1990s. And, and that is wow. a level of respect given unto him. And, and I've been very pleased. And it hangs in my home, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, on my wall when you come in the door. That, that's what you see when you walk in the door. Mm. So this his his uh, this is a, a during this Labor Day period. It's a wonderful you know um, opportunity to share uh, his work and his accomplishments. Now, um, what, how did he uh, set himself up? Did he come from uh, what was what was his lineage? Who did, where, did, where did he come from? My my, my great great grandmother uh, Rebecca, who was a midwife, by the way, um, owned the uh, plantation. Um, of, this of, is her, right? Right. Th this is my great great grandmother um, Rebecca. Uh -huh. uh, she, was, she was born in 1820, died in 1901. Uh, she was a midwife. Um, she also was a um, in, enslaved on her father's plantation, uh, and and primarily working in in the house. Uh, and so, um, so Uncle Benjamin is the first of that generation, um, the next generation born uh, into the institution of slavery, um, which also made him among the first to to um, to have a chance to see that institution, but also to understand the, the lessons of having independence and having your own. And so, she was a midwife by training, and so she had twenty-one children. Um, Ten, um, as the family law goes down. 10 passed for white, and we never saw another day of our life. And 11 stayed behind. And my goodness, you can see Uncle Benjamin. He could have lived mm -hmm. a whole new life in a whole new world. But but mm -hmm. he stayed among us. Uh, and and, uh, and we never forgot that. I don't think the family ever forgot that. And, and he enjoyed a revered place um, in the history. But so too did um, great, great grandmother Rebecca um, because of the work that she did. So you, when you say he stayed with us, do you mean because he could have he could have passed and he could have oh, passed? No, 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 no doubt. Did he have siblings that passed? And oh, yeah. Well, uh, as I stated, um, as the family lure and tradition has come down to me, uh, yeah. was that there were 21 children. Because when, when I went to the 1900 census, you know, I, I found uh, my great grandmother back. Um, she was a part of the group that had migrated away, but came back to North Carolina. And so in the 1900 census, she was in Henderson, North Carolina, down the street from my. Um, great grandfather and his brothers and sisters. And so, and she noted there that there were 21 children. That was the first time it appeared in a record that 21 children and of that uh, 11 stayed uh, in the African community and, and the other 10 as, as the story uh, matched up, disappeared and never was heard from ever again. Wow. And so with the, this, this midwife and the, um, you know, the brick, the uh, bricklayer, and brick, uh, made, what was what was what exactly was it? What what did he do? He made bricks, didn't he? No, no, no. no. Uh, they, they would. Uh, he uh, again. My great great grandfather, his father was a um, was a carpenter by trade, and so right. which was a very prized position on the plantation. And so he then passed on to all of his children. Um, the, the ability to not only be carpenters, and they were some were carpenters, and mm -hmm. others, um, and, and the other five, there was one brother, uh, he and a few others um, remained brick masons, meaning brick that they went and they were called upon, um, usually by um, mo most of the white clientele to sort of have their own crew, and they would go in and they would just, when, when we moved from wooden to brick structures, and they would just brick up these buildings, uh, and a lot of churches. Um, lots of storefronts, mostly, uh, mm -hmm. not just in Henderson, but also in Halifax County, North Carolina. And so, so that tells a lot about these craftsmen who had skill sets that most folks do not know 
um, you know, of the impact and work that they were able to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, but, but, but the most important thing is again, the, 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 the question of, of independence, what did they do? You know, they had choices. And so their choice was as opposed to working with someone else, they were their own bosses and then they hired others to work for them. And, and I think that's the symbolism that I have enjoyed over the years of seeing that level of, of, of uh, those who were industrious and, uh, and also most important, as you can tell from that photograph, uh, uh, they, they love themselves and they love photographs. And so uh, I told folks they were very photogenic because I hold about probably about 3,000 3, or more family wow. images from three and four different generations. Mm -hmm. And so did this labor allow them to buy and keep their, their land or, and how did, how does that relate to, you know, with your family's property now and, and how your family defines itself economically? Well, well that, that's important. Um, that's a very important question about um, land and the question of mobility and, and, and also freedom. What do people do with freedom after emancipation? And so great great grandmother, um, she, as I said, she was a midwife. Uh, and so, you know, uh, it, it is known that, uh, you know, she was um, um, li not literate as most were of that era. Um, mm -hmm. But but as I told folks, she may she not didn't read or write. She, yeah, she, she didn't, didn't know how to read and write. Um, okay. But but I told folks, but one thing she didn't know how to do, she didn't know how to count. And so she would take those monies and funds from delivering those babies, and she would then go out and buy land. Uh, and and so she ended up with about ten acres, and from that ten acres came about forty different lots. And and so um, I hold the deed along with several of my other siblings to land that dates back all the way back to 1883. Uh, and and so. And these were the first lands that she got when the counter was formed in 1881. In 1883, there she is buying, purchasing land, which came, by the way, from one of her ne her, her white nephews, by the way. And, and, and so from there, she um, she did something very important. She she made sure, and what I call, she built expectations. And what she did was, she conveyed uh, of those 10, 10 acres. She conveyed parcels to each of her children. And then, but she left something very important in that document. And that very important thing was that they could not sell that land, that it had to be conveyed to the next generation. And so and, and so, I told folks she was building expectations of what was to come. And, and, and what a powerful story that is, that uh, here it is that when, when other African-Americans are being removed out, migrating out, and a portion of them did migrate, by the way, and she went with them. But my, I'm told my great grandfather and uh, his brother went back up there to Massachusetts to Cambridge and they brought her back and said, we think she needs to be here uh, um, because uh, about 14 of them left and she was with them. And so so we're part of that migration. And you go to Cambridge where I um, studied at um, John F. Kennedy Presidential Library, by the way. Mm -hmm. I met my last relatives who were there and they then start sending me photographs from the New England side of the family. And, and so and that still goes on even today. And that was almost 25 years ago. Mm. Thank you, Andre. So let's actually go to the next image because okay. um, you have several distinguished uh, people. And I would say distinguished in the sense that they uh, have committed to, to service and to uplift within their communities. And this next image I could read is Charlotte Hawkins Brown, right. 1958. And there's a beautiful cake Another another image with a cake in it um, that we're celebrating for Labor Day. Labor Day. Um, so tell us about Charlotte Hawkins Brown and who was she? Why is she important to you? And also this photograph. Well, well, um, we we call her even her nephews, even her aunts call her Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Uh, she was the um, the founder. She um, was born in our hometown of Henderson. Um, right in the neighborhood in which we were born that belonged to our family. Uh, and that grandmother, Rebecca, her grandmother is who she saw. And so so that image there, I, I think, um, was, was very much a, a part of, of our family collect, collection overall. Um, it was taken inside of Canary Cottage, which was her home. And we called it um, down at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum today, um, by the way, which is the state's oldest and only museum named for an African-American name for a woman. She founded a school there, um, the Palmer Memorial Institute in 1902. It was the nation's uh, oldest black um, preparatory school in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so uh, we were proud of the fact that she was an educator, you know, went away to, to uh, when she, she was among that group that went to New England. But mm -hmm. in 1902, the American Missionary Association needed someone to come down to this little Bethany Institute to establish a school. And so she, um, she took the challenge to come back South 
to educate her people. And she ended up in Sedalia, and, and there she was able to, um, um, you know, the American, American Missionary Association um, kind of collapsed on her, didn't give her another dime. So she went back to New England, raised money, came back, and established her own school. Um, and, and that school then served the critical needs of those in the eastern part of Guilford County. Uh, and so it started as a regional school, but then mm -hmm. um, turned into, um, in 1930s, a, a private school. And, and so, but, but she also was a reformer. Uh, she was um, one of the longest serving heads of the North Carolina Federation of Negro Women's Clubs. And this is a powerful group of, of middle-class African-American women who, uh, who understood the challenges that existed and, and they worked for what they would call uplift. And so, so, but she has been our role model. Every house I've ever been into a relative, her portrait or something of her is still hanging on the wall today. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier um, during a pre-interview that her archives are at, at Radcliffe. Correct. Correct. Yes. Um, when she uh, when she passed in 1961, she was born in 1883, first of all, in mm -hmm. Mobile, our community. Uh, mm -hmm. And she died in 1961. And Radcliffe mm -hmm. uh, reached out to uh, my cousin, uh, Maria Hawkins Cole, who, mm -hmm. as you know, was married to Nat King Cole. And, and, and they re really early on recognized that she had um, a remarkable life and it was something that should be remembered. And so they then in turn um, came down and took her papers back. And, and that by 20 years later, the state of North Carolina realized how important she was to education among African-Americans. And then that's when I think uh, her name and recognition started growing even after her death. So, so her legacy was enhanced even more, not just while she was living, but even after she died. And so the state took on the challenge of making it the nation, the state's first state supported um, museum named for an African-American and for a woman. And so she, she is who we are quite proud of. And, uh, and I'm head of the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Historical Foundation, by the way, that supports wow. the museum there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown. And that's how you'd have to call, right? Because that's what just, <laughs> no matter what. So, you know, um, I, how can people find, so people can go on and Google her and, right. and go to Radcliffe, uh, Google her and Radcliffe and, and see some of her papers now. I think that you've been fighting to get them uh, online, even though they were in the institution. Yeah, yes, uh, her papers are being sold as, a, you know, as a scholarly set of papers all throughout the country um, through the Harvard University Press. And so uh, as a result of that, you know, I had um, started conversations saying, hey, um, you know, there, there needs to be more exposure because she's among what we call the three B's of higher education, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune and Nanny Helen Burroughs. And, and so as we would say, um, you know, Dr. Brown is probably the least known of those three because her records and papers have only been sold to scholarly institutions. And so thank goodness um, Radcliffe um, recognized that and they made her papers through Flickr uh, available to the much wider world. And we're thankful for that. Wow. Um Andre Vaughn, thank you so much for sharing, you know, these stories of uh, you know, to celebrate Labor Day of your ancestors and relatives, you know, to really give us a, a kind of model for, you know, for uh, uplift, service, uh, passing things down. Um, I, you know, it's really, it's really wonderful to, to, to hear and to see those images and to feel part of the family. Yes. Well, 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 thank you so much for allowing us to help tell just a little bit of our story. And we're appreciative of that. And so now we're going to go to another guest of ours. And that guest is uh, Linda Marin Mar Marinovich, who is uh, on, is Linda here, uh, who was part of our Family Pictures USA Detroit episode. And these are images that Linda shared with us when she was part of our Family Pictures USA uh, community photo share. Her family worked really hard with the um, the uh, the uh, unions and um, or union organizing in Detroit around the automobile industry. And, um, and you know, there were some amazing photographs when she came to uh, the community photo share at the Church of the Messiah. She brought images that were in trunks and we put together this, I think it was an eight foot table and all across the table were these images that Linda was sharing with us. And, um, and so it was really wonderful to have her 
um, uh, narrate some of these photographs. And I think we're, I think we might be, uh, there's some technical issues. So I think we're trying to uh, get Linda back online. And Linda's right here. Welcome, Linda. How are you? I'm just taking a bite of food. So please uh, <laughs> forgive. Um, I didn't expect, I, somebody, somebody stopped by my house. Uh -huh. A neighbor and I started talking. I said, I've got to take stay attention. And I'm like, I have to watch this because I missed the previous speaker. And he just sounded so interesting at first. And then I'm like, I didn't want to be rude either. So yeah. Well, you, well welcome. Welcome to our digital space. And in this in this Zoom moment, uh, even though we're using StreamYard. Um, <laughs> and so where are you? Are you in Detroit? Or where, where exactly? I'm in Detroit. I'm outside Detroit. And uh -huh. um, I wish I knew how to show you my beautiful garden because this is like something else. Wow. And my my mother was the gardener. Uh-huh. And my grandmother, I'm thinking in that picture that I had, um, was also a gardener. I mean, she gardened, but she grew food. So we would mm -hmm. go to her house and we would get, you know, corn on the cob and whatever. And yeah. let's actually let's actually go to that photograph. Okay. Um, there's a photograph That's with your grandma. This, this is that your grandmother's in this image, right? The image yeah. that you're holding up. This and is one of my favorite pictures because if you go back, there she is. That small little. She was only not even five foot tall, and then and the I can't remember everybody's name because sadly I'm trying to move. And so I don't have the names, but there's Walter Ruther is there. Um, Who was a major union leader? Major. Mm -hmm. And they, when they met her, they were looking, we need a woman who is going to um, be able to get the this um, contract through at Turnstead was the, um, the plant and to mm -hmm. get it so that women would vote for the union and they needed mm -hmm. a woman to do that. So when they met her, they were like, this is the woman. So, and, and sh they did unionize that. And when they. Did we lose you, Linda? Had a passion for justice. That's, that's how I grew up that you, mm -hmm. just, you had to be justice for everybody, mm -hmm. workers, you know, who cares what country you're from, whatever you're doing, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. And that, and so that's where she was a very much inspiration. And she went home and had a, she had a garden too. <laughs> All right. And this, this is the garden that you're sitting in. This is, this is her garden. No, this. I think where we're, I think the internet is a little unsteady where you are, Linda. So we, we, you, you cut out a, a couple of times. So I'm, I'm glad you're actually sitting down in one place because we're having some, I think as you move around, we might be having some technical challenges um, because you're freezing. But I want to actually go to the next image. I'm closer to my Wi-Fi. Okay, good, okay. good. So okay. old radicals look back. What is, is this your grandmother here? This is the same grandmother. Her name is Irene Marinovich. Well, it was Irene Young Marinovich, her mm -hmm. her her maiden name. Um, and then she married my grandfather, who was from Croatia and mm -hmm. uh, was a coal miner. And they lived in Illinois and then they mm -hmm. moved to Detroit. And she was mm -hmm. always. Um, it was just in her DNA. I mean, you had to make a difference and you had to stand up for what's right. Mm -hmm. And um, did she work inside and outside the house as well? I mean, before she became yeah, a union organizer, how did she, how did, how did she uh, get the attention of the union leaders? She went, and I, I'm trying to remember this exactly, but I think she worked at Turnstead and there mm -hmm. was these people that were putting out, we want to, um, unionize this this mm -hmm. uh, plant and um she walked up she heard their story and she was like yeah i'm in and then they went okay we want you to help us you know you got to get these other women and them and that i think she had always been involved in it and so would my grandfather because they moved to detroit 
from the coal mines in Illinois, Southern Illinois, mm -hmm. you know, the, for the $5 a day. Um, mm -hmm. So she worked on the assembly line and so did my grandfather. Always. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. That's what they did. And then my other grandfather, my mom's dad, mm -hmm. worked um, tool and die. So he had a little job up from them. Yeah, they were on they were on the uh, on the assembly line. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next photograph. Okay. Oh, this one is my mother, and I still have that suit. Um wow. and I can still wear that suit. <laughs> and um she was very nervous because she was meeting uh Paul Robeson. And um, she, I don't know the circumstance of how she met him, why he came to Detroit. Mm -hmm. My thought is that he performed. I mean, that had to. Yeah, he did a lot of what he was, I mean, if you look on YouTube, you can see all the uh, traveling he did to support uh, workers, not only across the United States, but also internationally. Um, you know, where he would sing for fundraisers in Ireland and you know, in, in the UK, et cetera. And so, um, so she, he, he might have been there doing some, a similar kind of event. And, but she looks really excited to meet him. And, and it's, a, it's a great image. I mean, when I first saw this image, when you shared it with us, you know, during the taping of the Family Pictures USA pilot, you know, it was, it was really striking. My, my, in fact, my aunt, my father's sister, lives right across the street where he, where I believe Paul Robeson either was born or his family or was raised, and there's a plaque there. And so, so you know, she moved there maybe about 20 years ago. So I've always, every time I go to visit her, I go and look at the plaque, and then I thought, you know, that he's been such a, you know, a kind of icon and unsung you know, a really American hero for, you know, workers. And, you know, today is the, um, you know, we're celebrating the um, uh, Labor Day. And I can't think of anyone that I want to, like, you know, really kind of hold up, at, you know, as a champion for, you know, workers and internationally than Paul Robeson. I, because I always... And that your mom is with him is awesome. <laughs> Uh, and I've had a few people will I'll say, well, like Paul Robeson, and it's really interesting. The people who know Paul Robeson, they're like, oh, Paul Robeson, you know, and others that don't. And it's like, oh, my God, I because we always li we listen to music, but we also heard about him. And I just mm -hmm. that picture has always been in my house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one, mm -hmm. because it, she was. Yeah. Yeah, and my mother and father also followed in their parents' um, footsteps about marching, you know, protests. I've been in a lot of protests. I mean, mm -hmm. they were really against the war in Vietnam. Um, we went to Washington to be a part of that as a family with mm -hmm. all my parents' friends. And mm -hmm. so here we were, we arrived, you know, and then we marched and then you get back on the bus and you go home and mm -hmm. it was to make awareness and mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. i mean people working is so important and we've somehow in my mind forgotten that we wouldn't have anything without all our essential workers right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely i think that you know this labor day in particular is so important in terms of thinking about people, you know, because also the pandemic is affecting, you know, affecting those essential workers, you know, people who, you know, either through, you know, uh, you know, can't like, you know, not yeah. stop work, you know, and retreat to, uh, you know, wherever and, um, you know, and ride out the pandemic, you know, so that we could, you know, really be, um, you know, be able to eat and function, have the you know the mail delivered, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, it's it's really great to you know be able to to celebrate this. I wanted to ask you, um, at what when you when you first came to Family Pictures, you brought a lot of images. What 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 led you to kind of bring you know so many photographs? Wow! <laughs> and, and to become part of. I didn't know exactly what you wanted. I mean, I kind of did, but I can't, I am notoriously bad at making decisions and I have so many. And what, what was interesting and why I really wanted to be a part of it was 
I did a lot of research after, like, and I still would like to go to the Walter Ruther um, Library in uh, at Wayne um, because they had lots of, they had images that I didn't have. That was one thing. Like, I did not have that image of my grandmother with all those men being the only woman to, to, to sign the document, you know, to get the, um, uh, the union state, you know, in, in that Turnstead um, plant. Mm -hmm. But also mm -hmm. there was another one that was my grandfather, which I had heard about this story. My, my father's father, the one from Croatia, he was a mm -hmm. tall guy, but he was like six one. And mm -hmm. he, was in this, this battle of the overpass and they, that the, the, is that the battle of the bridge the, the, mm -hmm. the they called it i mean when i always heard it was the battle of the overpass and, oh, I, see. Uh, I think we have that image oh if you do because he was hit over the head with a crowbar uh -huh. and he was never the same he went and had uh -huh. like i don't even know how many shock treatments and my uh -huh. grandfather was never the same uh -huh. and um Imagine getting hit over your head with a crowbar, you know, a friend of mine, she heard the story that he was thrown over the bridge. That's, that's not uh -huh. true. I would, uh -huh. I would remember that. And um, so in the picture, though, where they took a picture of Walter Ruther was also there. Can we, can we go to that picture, Quentin? They cut out my grandfather. But when I went to Wayne, I got the original I because see. he wasn't at the top. I mean, it's still the same. I mean, the world, mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. the top people want their, you know, photo op, you know, mm -hmm. and yet um, the guy who got hit over the head, you know, is kind of cropped out. But in this in this one picture from Wayne, they had that one. Mm -hmm. And and then they had, and they're so generous. I mean, they can, yeah, there it is. And my grandfather is behind, um, so I don't know how you're seeing it. So I'm seeing a man with a white shirt, then the mm -hmm. man, which is, I'm pretty sure, Walter Ruther. And mm -hmm. then behind him is my grandfather. And I'm um, imagining you go to a protest and you're wearing your white shirt and your vest. I mean, I, it just cracks me up. And they're all dressed up, but they were beaten up. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. But in the other one that I had, he was completely cropped out, but this one they had the original. And um, could you tell us what the protest was about? I mean, there are lots of protests. That, one, that was a very, very famous one, and it was to get it was union to get union in. But this was at at the Ford at a Ford plant, mm -hmm. and I'm really. I wish I had had more time to plan for this, and I would have had that up. I'm moving, and I'm. And we love you being here, so and tell I, me why. I mean, it's just insane. And then I was just diagnosed with, you know, just, I, I'm just like, oh, well, okay, but I got to be honest. So anyway, right. it was a battle that the, um, there's a number of other pictures that you might not have that I mm -hmm. might have sent later, but mm -hmm. they, um, so this plant that what my grandparents would say, well, the goons came and with, you know, crowbars and all that and just started beating people up to get them to leave mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh but in the end they did unionize the the plant and mm -hmm. um you know and and that has come up and down you know should we have unions and oh they're not so good this and that but the at that time if you take it in that time and even uh -huh. now i mean you have to people work together so that people hear you and mm -hmm. so in answer to your question about when I got there, why I brought so many pictures, I couldn't decide because I had so many that I didn't realize somebody's interested in this mm -hmm. because I have told all my friends, all this kind of thing. And, and people are mildly interested, um, mm -hmm. but not so much. And, and my, and yet my son told me, mom, all these stories, he was very, very young. Um, but it stayed in his mind enough to know that this was how important it was. And my other grandfather, I told you, was from India. And that even the racism that he endured, I mean, he got married to my grandmother. And her family said, oh, you've married a black man, so you're disowned. You know, and it's like, mm -hmm. and my, my, you know, my mother grew up in that soup. And then my son said, but I'm only two generations from it. 
So that's why I can be more aware why history is so important is mm -hmm. that you teach these things, but he also then realized, wow, that's why it's so important to me. Because mm -hmm. I know I know these people. I know what the effects of it are. Mm -hmm. And the effects are devastating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Quentin, can we go to the next image? I want to just make yeah. sure we, we cover all the images uh, from Linda going forward. Is there another one? Yeah, there's another one. Actually, it might be uh, Lindsay. Uh, we're going to go to the next image. And you were talking oh. about your grandfather from India, and this is, this is, is this? and this is my grandmother Audrey, and his name was Tom, um, mm -hmm. Thomas. Um, but they were probably at that stage, sixteen and eighteen. Oh. I'm not. I'm not unless they're married, and I can't see from here if there's a wedding ring on them. In mm -hmm. which case, I mean, she got married. She was seventeen. Wow. Nineteen. Wow. And, and they were very, very, very devoted. And that picture shows that. It really does. They loved each other to the last I, to the last second. It was a really beautiful thing to see. And what kind of work did they do? Uh, well, he was a tool and dye maker. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother um, worked in the auxiliary. So she worked to support, because they had a lot of sit-ins and you know, Flint, that was a big one. I have some pictures mm. of her making things, selling them, you know, offering for the making food for everybody who was on, you know, who was at a, at a sit down strike or whatever. Mm -hmm. So she didn't, that was, she was very, I can't believe I had four parents, grandparents all. So that was their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was wow. Life. And wow. then my, dad and mom met at work so they didn't they didn't meet through them i mean they, they all knew each other they didn't know each other but my dad and mom didn't know each other so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. let's go to the next image lindsay oh this is a uh, this is cool because this one is my great grandfather very tall big man with my grand my great grandmother great grandfather great grandmother and um the girl is my and the baby that she's holding is my grandfather mm -hmm. so th this photograph was taken in india you know what i i'm absolutely not sure because i know that they also lived in ohio for a while dayton ohio uh -huh. and then went back to India, my grandmother, great grandmother died when my grandfather was nine. Uh -huh. And then my grandfather didn't know what to do with these kids. And so he had them grow. Um, he sent my grandfather, I don't, not with the, his sister, just the grandfather to Dayton to live with a family from a church. So he was a minister. He was, um, in the ministry, you know, trying to convert um, people to Christianity in India. Mm -hmm. And um, she, uh, so when he got to Dayton, Ohio, they washed him in Clorox. They had never seen a person dark like that, I mean, especially Dayton, Ohio. I'm thinking, I mean, in 19... 10 or something like that mm -hmm. and they washed him in Clorox and mm -hmm. um he let he ended up staying there for a, a few years and very young age he used mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. um the old man meaning um Ford uh -huh. um, saved my life he got me I got to get in that I got a good job I came up mm -hmm. I got you know he's a tool mm -hmm. and die maker mm -hmm. and um so he was washed in Clorox, and ironically, he goes and becomes a tool and dye maker in, uh, at, at the Ford plant. <laughs> oh, God. And that saved his life. I know you're thinking, that saved your life. We won't get into all the other things that Ford was a part of, you know. I mean, I'm just saying. And um, But anyway, on one-on-one, -on -one, 
<laughs> my grandfather would go through, everybody knew him at the plant because he would read um, Bible um, excerpts and um, uh -huh. because it was always, it's always about being kind and caring, compassion, all those things. And he would, mm -hmm. that's what he did. And you inherited that with your wonderful energy. And Aww. sharing your beautiful garden on, la on our Labor Day program with us. Linda, thank you so much thank for you. being part thank of Family you. Pictures USA and, and for, you know, taking time out of your intense schedule to share some of your family album and some of your ancestors and hello to your son. And, and um, yeah, we, we wish everyone a, a wonderful uh, Labor Day. I wanted to thank... Uh, Marcy Brennan uh, and Chris and Andre Vaughn. Um, and uh, and just as a one last moment, Marcy, did you have, have a, any questions for anyone? Did you want to say something? Uh, I, I know I, that, that you talked about the Radcliffe archive, but you were also part of the uh, Tibetan archive. I, I, we could spend hours talking about both of these stories because they're absolutely fascinating. I'm so glad to hear them. And I miss Family Pictures USA. I hope you guys can go back into production because talk about a binge-worthy show. Oh, my God. We watched all the episodes. Um, I, 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 well, you know what? I, we could tell people, I'll tell people that the Bettman Archive is was brought by Corbus, and I think you were part of the Bettman Archive for a, a while. And, you know, um, if people organize their family albums and their archives, you know, think about where you might want them to go, what historical society you might want them to go to, how they use them creatively in making uh, books, uh, writing um, uh, writing uh, novels. Um, and also, um, my mom has actually just written a novel based on a, um, a, a, a short story that my uh not sure, but a, um, an interview that I did with my grandfather when I first got my video camera. I don't know if someone's typing somewhere. Um but uh, I just wanted to thank all of you for being here and um I wish you a wonderful and happy and commemorative Labor Day. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. And I have one more thing. Will we be able to connect with uh Marcy? Because I have 110,000 photos that are on my computer. And then I have probably that many in boxes. So I would love to have my photos organized. We can talk. We can talk. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thanks so much. And whoever is actually uh, typing, we can hear you, who's been typing the last few uh, few minutes. We can hear all of that sound. Um, I'm Thomas Allen Harris. I'm the host of Family Pictures USA. Um, I am um, broadcasting live from Martha's Vineyard, visiting my good friend Martha Jones. Martha Jones, you want to come on camera just to... I just want to, who, an artist who has a show up right now, we can, we can leave the wine out of the uh, shop, but this is my friend Martha Jones, who's in, whose house I'm in, and just wanted to acknowledge her. I'm also on her computer <laughs> for this broadcast. You want to say anything, Martha? I, I wonder what this is. You know? <laughs> she just came back to her home. I know they're lovely. I know they're lovely people you're talking with. I can hear that. And you're enjoying yourself. I'm having a great so they time. they must be really lovely. We're celebrating Labor Day. Oh, so, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. So thanks, everyone, okay, and wishing everyone a great Labor Day.